What is up, Netflix fans? Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm giving you my 10 best Netflix original movies of 2023. If you don't know what we do here, we like to talk streaming films and TV shows. So in 2024, we're gonna be doing a lot of that. Join if you want, subscribe. It's cool if you don't, I get it. As always, I didn't see every movie. I saw a lot, but there are films like Leo, and old dads that I didn't get a chance to watch. So uh, leave a comment down below. What movie did I miss? And what is your list overall? I have some honorable mentions and not great films, but they're okay. They weren't me mentioning like Chicken Run, the sequel. I thought it was fine. There was a movie based around The Last Kingdom, one of the best Netflix shows. It wasn't perfect, but there were really good moments. Uh, the Christian Bell movie, The Pale Blue Eye, which I wasn't as high on as some people, but maybe you would enjoy that one. Or Rustin, a story that struggled overall, but the performance from Coleman Domingo is amongst the best of the year. Let's start with number 10. You're so not invited to my bar mitzvah. This is an Adam Sandler movie with his kids. And as always, you got the Adam Sandler cast and it. Okay, it's going to be another silly, ridiculous Netflix comedy that's not very good because he's had a lot of those, even though I defend Adam Sandler and I will until the day I die. But this film with that cast under that production banner was actually really cute. And I was able to connect with some of the main characters. Normally, high school drama, it doesn't really work for me, but this whole concept of building up to this huge event, this bar mitzvah, it's like, who are we gonna invite? It's gotta be the biggest thing ever. It's over-dramatized in the film. It's ridiculous. They're inviting musical guests and stars and DJs, but it's done with a purpose. And the film is trying to tell you how important this is in real life to these kids. And Sandler in the movie, while he's kind of playing himself at times, is actually really, you can tell he's emotional about this subject. So this is one of those films that caught me by surprise. I didn't even review it on this channel, but I watched it two weeks later and said, okay. Okay! Wait, maybe I did a YouTube short. Still, it's a good it's a good film. Not everyone's going to love it, especially if you don't love the genre. It's very conventional at times. The dialogue's not great, but I think it's, it's worth a watch, especially if you're a Sandler fan and his kids, they did great. That's pretty good. All right, we just watched this movie. Sam Esmail, Julia Roberts, Mahershala Ali, Ethan Hawke, uh, Kevin Bacon's in there. Leave the world behind. As you know, if you saw my review, I did not like the ending. I wasn't a fan. It brought it down a handful of notches. And... In a way, this movie kind of feels like The Happening, which I think is a terrible film. What? No. What? No. But thankfully, Esmail actually shows some directing chops here and brings it all together in a way that builds suspense, showcases a nice amount of intensity, and by the time you get to the middle of the film, you don't know a lot about what's going on, even though Ali's character is kind of giving you a little bit, but the mystery surrounding it all is compelling. The tension between the two families on display. And that is kind of an example of the tension that we're supposed to be feeling from the outside world. We don't get a lot of the outside world here. It's a grand thing happening, but it's a very small movie. I respect that. I appreciate that. It's a fun film to watch, right? It's overly ridiculous in moments, but there are certain sequences like the Tesla sequence and when all the animals are coming, it's, it's, it's freaky, man. The movie freaked me out. I'll be honest. It's, Kind of, kind of scared me. I'm a little nervous. But that's what you want from a movie like this. This experience was a good one. And while I probably won't watch it again, if somebody said, hey, do you want to watch this? I'd be like, yeah, okay, let's do it. Next up, a movie that will get nominated for Best Picture. This slowed down on my list. I liked it. I liked Maestro. I thought it was good. Uh, there are things about these characters that I found extremely intriguing and interesting. The emotions on display between Cooper and Mulligan are fantastic, and both of their performances warrant an Oscar nomination. The reason why I didn't fully connect with this film is because we're not necessarily showing the composer side of our lead character. It's more so the romantic side, and that's the focus of the film. We don't get a grand composing scene until until the third act, and I thought it was beautiful. And the third act, I actually really started to connect, and, and the movie was growing on me. I'm like, yeah, this is really good. Where was this at the beginning? In the beginning, it's beautiful, visually, right? The black and white, as we slowly go into color, and the shadows are really harsh. I, I talked about all this in my review. And aesthetically, the entire movie works. It's just the script couldn't get fully invested. 
I just felt like I was constantly trying to connect and be there with our characters in the moment, but when they're back to back in that field, it's some beautiful dialogue, but at the same time, we keep going back and forth, the movie feels a little bit choppy, and it couldn't fully find its footing to where I was super invested until the third act. Still, a good movie. Warrants many Oscar nominations, but Best Picture, it'll get it. I just don't know if it deserves it. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! This is the wonderful story of Henry Sugar. Wes Anderson. A Wes Anderson movie on Netflix. Austin, when did that happen? Well, it came out earlier in the year, and I think it actually did fairly well for what it was, but it was also surrounded by a lot of other short stories. I believe there were four total that Anderson released. This is the only one that I watched, and I'm punching myself right now because maybe those other movies would be on this list even though they're technically super short. This one's short, but it's still almost an hour long, so I'm counting it as a feature-length film. Just a short feature-length film. But it told an interesting story, a poetic, very Wes Anderson, uh, you know, just the visuals and everything that he normally does with that, but one that was actually compelling, and Benedict Cumberbatch playing multiple characters, Ben Kingsley playing multiple characters, Dev Patel and uh, Ray Fiennes. I mean, this, this cast was awesome in the numerous roles that they play and this story what he's what our main character is learning and trying to do and using it in real life and establishing himself as this force of nature but told in just the most artistic and some would say pretentious way it does feel pretentious at times but i enjoyed this as an experience and it's like the perfect length that's what she said <laughs> And how often have I said that in 2023? If you like Wes Anderson, you'll enjoy this. How about they clone Tyrone? Jamie Foxx, John Boyega, Tiana Paris. A great cast. The chemistry and the camaraderie between these three as they delve into this big underground-ish conspiracy going on, this mystery surrounding this town with so many themes and the racial tension that you're experiencing all throughout the film. And then you got Kiefer Sutherland playing a role. I didn't know that was Kiefer Sutherland at first. I'm like, wait a sec, no, that's... Okay, so you're getting all of these things that you are just, you don't know that you want until you finally get it. It was a really entertaining movie. My issue with They Clone Tyrone is there are moments where I felt as if they could have, they could have dived a bit deep, dove. I don't know. Dived, dove, dove a bit deeper and it would have helped the audience. The mystery isn't fully explored. After the first act, the second act really struggled to keep my interest. The banter's great, but there's so much going on with this, uh, what inevitably becomes an enthralling mystery before you get introduced to Kiefer Sutherland's character, but that middle portion I really struggled to stay invested with. But by the time you get to the end, it's like, okay, this was an entertaining movie, uh, some really good character moments, a cast that's fantastic, and Jewel Taylor does a nice job with the direction, so a good movie on Netflix. Go check this one out. How about an animated film? Nimona. This was so much fun. Riz Ahmed, Chloe Grace Moretz, I... And the animation, it's really, really good. It's not game-changing. I will compare it to, like, a Spider-Verse and Mitchell's vs. the Machines. It's different, right? But in terms of just doing something a little more creative than what we often see, uh, but this story is one that was actually pretty emotional. Emotional damage! And the world, this futuristic medieval Blade Runner meets olden times type of world that they're establishing and the knight that's trying to prove himself innocent of what happens at the beginning of the film and he meets Chloe Grace Moretz's character who is absolutely fascinating and the emotional touch that you get at the end and, and you know, let your kids watch this, yes, but if you're an adult and your kid's watching, First of all, watch it with them. Second of all, you might get something out of it. I did. I, I personally thought it was a fun film. Uh, it has its issues on occasion, some pacing problems here and there. It's not perfect. It's not my favorite animated movie of the year, but it's really, really good, and I'd say it's worth your time. Phoebe Dynever, uh, Alden Ehrenreich, this is fair play. This is... I didn't know what this movie was going to be, to be honest with you. I knew that they would get in arguments and there would be some sexual tension from the trailer, but what is, what is this? What the f*** is this? One of these two characters gets a promotion. That causes some tension because the other character wants that promotion. Some sexual tension, but also some workplace tension, and it spirals out of control. And the secrets that they're hiding, but also the secrets that they have between each other and the feelings that they're holding back that inevitably become unleashed when we get a very marriage story type of sequence at the end. 
I really had a good time with this, mostly due to the performances, man, especially Alden Ehrenreich. That's, that's two this year, Oppenheimer and Fair Play. Awesome. I was really invested. It, you know, once again, another example of towards the middle, I'm like, okay, let's see what's happening here. But I love these workplace dramas that inevitably make their way home. That's what this did. And the final few scenes, the intensity and the unexpected level of just shock that you get at the end. And I understand some people aren't going to love the ending. I get it. And I, I even see why. But I just, the entire experience for me, this is a really compelling movie. I liked it. Hey, man, you can get on to me all you want. Extraction 2. I didn't even love the first Extraction. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. I, I, I liked it. You got the big one taken there. This was a better story. Not the greatest story I've ever seen, but a more compelling story. But the action leveled up in a way that I just didn't expect. And I think some people are jaded because we've got the John Wicks of the world and we've had other films this year where the action sequences are incredible, Mission Impossible included. But man, oh man, the one-take sequences from Sam Hargrave, they are just so freaking entertaining. Chris Hemsworth is a force in this movie, a force of nature. And I was so just on board with the entire film because it knows what it is. It knows it doesn't have to be too pretentious with its story. It's like, all right, we don't need to spend a ton of time on that. It kind of reminded me of the first John Wick. I'm not going to say it's as inventive and it built up this world in a way, but it reminded me of it and it provided a sequel that was bigger, better, more compelling, still not overly compelling, not the best characters I've ever seen, a somewhat cliche story, but when you know what you are as a movie and you lean heavily into the action like this film did, it creates a great experience, and I had a great time. Oh, good for you! And how was it? A film that I didn't get to review on this channel, a little busy that week in May, December. May, December provides two of the best perform, three of the best performances of the year. All three should warrant Oscar nominations. Uh, I believe one is going to have a good shot at winning. Who is that? It's the guy from Riverdale. Charles Melton, what, what's he doing here? He's great in this film. Holding back so many emotions. Um, I know this is listed, was this listed as a comedy at the Golden Globes? I'm not entirely sure. I think it is. I, and somebody said the director, Todd Haynes, who's a phenomenal director, said that was his decision. I, I disagree with that. This subject matter is not funny. <laughs> I understand there's one little hot dog joke at the beginning. And the way that is filmed is exquisite. And I just, I really love the filmmaking in this movie. It makes it what it is, along with the performances from Portman, who is amazing. One scene that reminded me of how good she was in Black Swan. And then Julianne Moore. Come on, it's Julianne Moore. Do I have to say how good she is, uh, but beyond that, Haynes' direction and how this keeps it so serious, even though this is subject matter that you could do a lot with, right? And there's this comedic edge to certain sequences and certain scenes, but when it's time to get serious and discuss this subject matter, the movie does it. And that's why I think it's more, much more, of a dramatic film that keeps you on edge with its dialogue, with its camaraderie and chemistry in certain moments, but then other moments you've got uh, heartbreak and, you know, the scene, the sequence between Julianne Moore and Charles Melton towards the end of the movie when he finally starts to kind of break out of that shell that he's been crammed into his entire life and you can tell his feelings and the emotions that he's able to showcase, the scene on the roof, the scene at the end with graduation, a lot of it comes back to Charles Melton and how good he actually was, man. He was, he was truly great in this film, uh, but you have a story that is important, and I believe this is an important story to tell, and the way that it handled it, as honest as it actually was, the screenplay by Sammy Birch, yeah, this is a, wow, it's a very well-told story. Not the most thrilling movie I've ever seen in my life, but a well-told and compelling drama with awesome performances. That's all you can ask for on Netflix, to be honest. Number one, Heart of Stone. Just kidding, you people. Just kidding, they're not in my top 10. Uh, number one is The Killer. It's David Fincher. This is a film that I saw and I really, really enjoyed. I was really engaged with, but part of me felt as if, maybe I was expecting a different kind of film because this is, we're talking about comedies. This film has a comedic sensibility to it that I didn't expect 
It's honestly one of the most subtly funny movies of the year. Not laugh out loud funny, but just kind of like this guy. This guy. He spins an entire stretch, this huge monologue, saying how cold and calculated and focused he is. To do that, like it was, that is brilliant. Brilliant! By David Fincher. And once my brain clicked and I watched the movie again, I'm like, yeah, that's that. He, was, he did everything he was going for. Still not my favorite Fincher film, but the way that this story surrounding this cold and calculated assassin played by Michael Fassbender and how good he is, but constantly telling us that and then doing the exact opposite. That's a really cool concept, man. And while I normally don't like voiceover in a movie, it's constant Michael Fassbender voiceover. This actually really worked, to be honest with you. And then at the same time, I'm like, ah, you know, there's, there's not a ton of action in this movie. It's just kind of following this guy around. Well, Fincher said it best in an interview. He said, I want you to have this unnerved feeling the next time you go to the grocery store and somebody's standing behind you. It's just you don't know who they are. You don't know what they're capable of. It could be anyone. He gets you. It could be an assassin. It could be a killer. You just don't know. This eerie feeling that you have when Fassbender's character is just walking around an airport or getting in a car. This guy is capable, well, he thinks he's capable of so much throughout this film, and he just blends in with the rest of us. This is a fascinating exploration of the psyche and the mind of a killer, and there's some other good performances in there, Tilda Swinton at the end of the movie, and then here and there, but you're really, it's its Michael Fassbender. It falls on his shoulders. It's up to him to protect us and make us feel warm. And does he do that? No, because he's a killer. It's a great performance. It's a great film, in my opinion. But again, it's one where it's tone and the shift in tones on occasion it's not going to quite work for everyone. So if you watch this and you think it's a little pretentious and boring, I get it. But then I watch that action sequence halfway through the movie. I'm like, no, that's that's not boring. That is a brutal action sequence. David Fincher, this is where you should live. This genre. Just kidding. Go back to Mindhunter. It's the best show on Netflix. Thank you guys so much for watching. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. I hope you have a beautiful day. Uh, spend time with your family. Spend time with your friends. Or don't. Just open gifts in your room by yourself. That's what I plan on doing. All right. Thanks so much for watching. Top 10 movies of the year. It's coming soon. And best Netflix shows of 2023.